My pleasure, man. Appreciate you being here. I, all right, I see it. I see it. Good evening, everybody. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started. I am a minute late, so there you are. Um, but we're going to get started this evening. I've got a couple of quick things we need to say before we pray, and then we're going to get right into the Word. And um, I will tell you, it's interesting as a pastor when you get a sermon or a lesson or something together, and God confirms to you before you even get started that that was exactly what he wanted you to say, that it was exactly what he wanted you to speak about. So, um, because with what I'm going to be speaking about tonight, um, just the conversations that we were having, they just kind of went that direction, and so that's confirmation for me, so I'm excited about it. But let's, uh, let me go over a couple of quick announcements if I can. Don't forget that uh, we've got, what, a week, I guess, left of our uh, laundry detergent, or some of you are calling it washing powders, which is not powder, but anyway, uh, but our laundry detergent fundraiser, and uh, thank you to all of you who have uh, bought some, and uh, we appreciate it, and I know I've still got to buy some, but I uh, appreciate you doing that. That All that money goes towards World Missions, and uh, we're excited to see how much we're going to come up with, but that's going to be for the rest of the month of May, and so you just need to see uh, either Brother Chris right. There he is. Hey, either Brother Chris Riley or Rebecca or Glenda or my wife because she does everything. Uh, but you need to see one of them about um, about purchasing that. Uh, they're $50 for a bucket. It's about 600 loads. And uh, hopefully um, we'll be able to really make a difference for World Missions with that. So that's going to be uh, the rest of uh, this month. I do want to mention that we're going to have a, a guest speaker. I have to go for my niece's graduation this weekend in Georgia. And... Um, was really hoping she wouldn't pull it off, but she did. So anyway, uh, but I'm going to have to be gone for that on Sunday. But uh, Brother Mike Rumbo is going to be here speaking for us on Sunday. And so uh, if you are wondering if he's any good, just go to this table over here and ask them, and they'll tell you how great he is, right? Gary, right? Gary's like, he's all right. Anyway, uh, you better get over that. All right, so... Uh, but anyway, uh, he, uh, he's going to be with us on Sunday, and so please come on out and uh, hear what he has to say. Um, we are still asking anybody that would like to give towards youth camp, as far as if you'd like to help sponsor a child. Uh, the senior and or the high school and middle school camps are $160 for a camper to go. The junior camp is $140. We have some campers going in all three of the camps. We have some workers going in two out of the three camps, I believe it is. Uh, but if you would like to sponsor a child, all you've got to do is just mark on your tithe envelope, or if you send it in through Venmo, you can mark it on your uh, gift that you just would like that to go to youth camp, and we'll make sure that it goes. We appreciate that. But if you're saying, well, but what's in it for me? Fine, be that way. The kids are selling Sonic gift cards that for $5 a piece, and it'll help you save some money on some food, you greedy thing. And uh, so you can buy those from the kids, and that money also is going towards youth camp and going to towards our youth fund. Um, so I wanted to mention those things. Uh, there are some other things, I believe, but uh, of course, camp meeting's coming up. Uh, it's just about a month away, and uh, it's going to be an exciting time. I know the last couple of camp meetings we have have been absolutely phenomenal. So if you're able to make it out even for one night, um, I know Sunday night they're starting at 6.30. They usually start at 6. We're starting at 6.30 is what they said, and there was a youth service at the Lake City PH Church, but then uh, the other uh, service will be um, uh, will be at the Tabernacle, and then the rest of the nights, Tuesday through, or well, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday are going to be at seven, and then uh, Thursday night is the uh, what does it say, Turbyville train? That isn't what it's called. Is that what it's called? The the Hope train, Hope train. Thank you. I knew Turbyville train didn't sound right, but anyway, that'll be on Thursday night. So uh, if you're able to make it for any of those services, or if you're in a, a situation where you're able to come in the mornings, uh, the morning services will be at 1030, I believe it is, uh, Monday through Thursday. So uh, just keep that in mind. Uh, that's in June. That's the I, I didn't even tell you the dates. I'm telling you the times, not even telling you the dates. That is going to be June 23rd through the 27th. So a little over a month from now, but um, it's going to be a great time if you can make it. Try to get yourself out there. One other thing that I wanted to mention um, have some good news. Uh, unless something has changed, Brother Cheryl Orvin is at home. He uh, 
Crystal and I went to see him and Sister Velvely yesterday, and he looked fantastic. And uh, he said, they're getting ready to do my swallow test here in a little bit and uh, because he's not been able to eat since he fell. Uh, he's been having to use a feeding tube and everything. And, and they said, uh, we're getting ready to do the swallow test. And I said, well, we're going to pray that the Lord uh, really helps you to be able to pass that swallow test. And, and we were having a fine time talking until he saw the guy wanting to do the swallow test walk by his room a couple of times. Mm -hmm. And then I kept seeing him look out the door. He's like, yeah, I think they're wanting to do the test. I think, I, we're like, okay, we'll leave now. Yeah, yeah, it's like, yeah, 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 get out. I got to swallow something. So anyway, uh, but he passed the test, and so that's great. But uh, uh, they, uh, they were having to work, get his hospital bed delivered, which I, I believe it was delivered today. But then I got word from uh, Vicky that uh, it, he was coming home at 6 this evening. Now, I have been asked. He is not ready for visitors, so please don't descend upon his house and say, hey, you're home, let me sit down for three hours. He's not up for that. But uh, but anyway, we are hoping he's going to be able to be in service with us soon as the Lord is strengthening him. Please continue to pray for Sister Velvely. She has wore herself out being right there trying to help do all the work that she didn't feel the nurses were doing. You know how it goes. And so uh, be keeping her in your prayers as well. But uh, we're just I, I just had to announce that, let you guys know that uh, that he has come home, and uh, all praise to God. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and then we'll get right into the, the lesson this evening, and uh, just believe that God is going to do some wonderful things in our church, that he's going to continue to do wonderful things in our church, and that uh, we're going to continue to see the hand of God moving. Amen? Let's go ahead and pray together. Father, we thank you, Lord, for all of your wonderful blessings all the favor and love that you show us each and every day. God, we thank you for the great testimony of Brother Cheryl coming home, Father, the, the prayers that have been going up over the past two, two and a half months or so, uh, just lifting him up in prayer and believing that you were going to bring healing, and God, that is what you have done. You have brought healing to his body. You have brought him from places where we didn't know if he was going to make it, but God, you knew, and you intervened, and you did the work, and we thank you and praise you for it. Continue to give him strength as he continues to recover, and Sister Velvely as well. And Lord, we just ask right now as we go into this lesson tonight, Father, that you would just open our hearts and our minds to the word, that we will be ready to receive it, that we will, we will listen to what is coming forth, and that we'll apply it to our hearts and our lives, Father. And God, I pray for every need that's represented in this house. I know there are some that are sick. There are some that are dealing with uh, other problems, family problems, and, and there are some dealing with financial problems and all of that. God, you are greater than everything that comes against us. You are greater than every battle that we face, Lord, and we are already made victorious through you. So help us to hold on to faith, uh, with faith to that victory that you have given us through Jesus Christ, and we will be careful to give you praise and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. If you have your Bibles, I want you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 2, and we're going to read a passage of Scripture that's pretty familiar but then we're also going to read a couple of scriptures right after that. We're going to read 2 Timothy 2, starting with verse 15. But then we're going to go through verse 18. So I can talk to you about what the Lord has laid on my heart for today. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 15. And if you've never heard this verse, you haven't heard me preach very much. Because it seems like I preach it quite a bit. And I teach it quite a bit. But the word says, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now we're going to continue on through verse 18. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Actually, I'll go ahead and I'll read verse 19 as well. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Amen. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. So, what I wanted to talk to you about today um, I don't know how many of you have heard that the Boy Scouts of America have changed their name to now it's just like gay scouting or something. No, I'm kidding. It's not that. But it's it's like just scouting USA or something like that because they're wanting to, uh, they, they've basically, they've given up all the principles that they have held on to for all these years 
and they've decided that they want to uh, allow girls to come into Boy Scouts, and even though there's Girl Scouts and and trans, and they want to allow trans pack leaders and and gay pack leaders and all these kinds of things. So these were things that for a long time they just it just wasn't happening uh, because it was a uh, it was a corporation. It was it was a Organization, thank you. Lord, have mercy. It just kind of went out of my head, and I was like, hello, the word's right there. It was an organization that was founded on the word of God. And so, um, but they've gone this separate way. So I was reading an article, and because of what the Boy Scouts have done, there has been a huge uptick in people who have been chartering Awanas. How many of you are familiar with Awanas? You know what Awanas are. Okay. When I was a child... We attended the Church of God, and um, but we didn't have anything like Awanas or Royal Rangers or anything like that. And so my mom found a church just down the road from us, or from actually from our church rather. Uh, it was a Baptist church, Zion Baptist Church in Zion, Illinois, and they had an Awanas program. And we went, and my brother and I uh, went to that for years, years. I mean, I went to it first when it was Sparks, which is like the very first level. And then uh, it's kind of like going from brownies to Girl Scouts. You know, it's like you got that first level, it's Sparks, and then it's Awanas. And uh, I know you might be thinking, well, what on earth does Awana mean? It actually means approved workmen are not ashamed. And, uh, and that's where we uh, get the name from. And the whole thing is Bible-based. It is co-ed, and so, but it was always co-ed. It was always boys and girls coming together and just learning about the gospel. Most of the scripture that I know today that I will never forget, even if I, even if I go into dementia or, or what have you, I know I'm not going to forget these scriptures. Most of the scriptures I know today came from me going to Awanas. Uh, we would have competitions where we would have to learn the scripture and, and memorize the scriptures, and, and we would get these badges and these jewels and these crowns and all this kind of thing. It was really pretty neat. Um, I'm not sure how they do it now, um, but that's the way it was for me back then, but one of, the, one of the scriptures that I remember learning first at Awanas was, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And that's something that I have stuck with my entire life. That's something that I have preached, I have taught, I have said the importance of it. I've even gone in and looked at it and said, if we look at that, we see that the phrase, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, is actually set off by commas which when you have a phrase that is set off by commas like that, it normally is a descriptive phrase of the object directly in front of it. And so there are some preachers that will preach, you know, we don't need to be ashamed of the gospel is what that word's saying. That's really not what that verse is saying. What the verse is saying is that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God because he is a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed of his work. And I can tell you right now that there's a lot of preachers and teachers and so-called Christians out there that I believe are shaming God because of the fact they're saying that they're Christian, they're saying they know the word, and then they speak it, and they speak it out of context. They speak it, and they twist it for their own agenda instead of preaching and, and saying what it truly, truly is. And so um, that verse is saying that we're to study to show ourselves approved unto God. He's a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed of his work. You know, the Bible says that uh, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it. The Bible talks about how he is the potter and we are the clay, and so he is He is. A, working, we are his work, and uh, he doesn't need to be ashamed of his work, and so we need to know that word so that we can rightly divide the word of truth. And what that means is so we can read the scripture and actually t actually know what it says instead of just what we want it to say. For example, uh, how many of you have ever heard the paraphrase of the scripture, the Bible says that we're to work out our own salvation? How many of you ever heard of that? Not we're just two of you. Okay, great. We need to get more into the word, folks. No, um, I've heard so many people try to say, well, the Bible says we're to work out our own salvation. You know what that means? Brother Steve, that means what's a sin to you is not a sin to me. So you might think it's a sin. Fine, don't do it then. But I think it's okay. So I'm going to go ahead, I'm going to do my thing. That's not what that scripture is saying. And that's by, by twisting it in that manner, it, it is actually going to cause people to fall away. So when we take a look here in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, we usually stop with just verse 15. We read that and then we move on and we talk about the importance of study. But let's read what, again, what those verses say after it because it says to, sh to study to show yourself approved. 
But then the next thing it says is shun profane and vain babblings. I love the fact that they word it as babblings because that's really what a lot of it is. A lot of these people that are, are throwing this stuff out, they're just babbling. They're just ma 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 ma, trying to convince people to believe what they believe. And it's just all in vain. And it says, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their word will eat as, as doth a canker. And then he goes, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus? Let me just tell you right now, Paul just called out these two. He just flat threw them under the bus and said, you know, it's going to eat away at you like those dudes, and called him by name. Paul didn't pull any punches. Paul was just <laughs> kind of out there. I guess Paul was able to. So, um, But as we, as we read this, and I'm, I'm going to back up a little bit because I don't want to get too far ahead, but we need to understand that as the church, as the bride of Christ to be, you know, we, we are the church and we are the body of Christ, members of the body, it is our responsibility to make sure that anything we put out concerning his word is accurate. Anything that we put out concerning his word can be backed up. When we were talking just a few moments ago, and I was uh, telling the gentleman over here that you know that's how a lot of cults will start, that's how a lot of these crazy ideas will start, is people will take one verse and base their entire doctrine around that one verse and a misinterpretation of it at that and they won't they have no other verses to support it because what they're trying to say is not truly what the verse is saying one of the things that we were talking about is how um you know how john three sixteen, as a matter of fact it says and most of you know it for god so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever what believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life now the discussion we were having was how that there are those that will take that verse and say, well, I believe in Jesus, so I'm saved. And they'll just leave it at that. And then they go on with their life. And they believe in Jesus, but they don't live a life that shows a life that is in line with the commandments of Christ. But they believe in him. I mean, there are people that uh, you probably know some. Uh, hopefully you're not one of them. But you probably know some that they say they're Christian. Well, you know, I'm being a good Christian woman or being a good Christian man, I got to make sure I'm doing this and I'm doing that. But then you look at the way the rest of their life is lived and there is no sign whatsoever of them being in line with the Bible. You look at the way that they live and they lie, they, they cuss, they drink, they smoke, they do drugs or they sleep around or whatever it is. They do all these sorts of things, but then they say, but I believe in Jesus. Well, does that mean that they're saved? Because even though they're doing all these things against the Word of God, does that mean that they're saved? Of course not. But that's where study comes in. Because if you go and you begin to study that word believe, when Paul says to the jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house, it's more than just believing the way that we interpret believe. You've got to remember, the scripture we have, this, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, the King James Version is, in my opinion, the best English translation closest to the, the true uh, spirit of the word from the Greek and from the Hebrew, the Aramaic, all right? In my opinion, I'm not saying if you read the NIV or if you read the Holmes Christian Standard or if you, now if you read the message, you're probably off base. But anyway, but I'm not saying that if you read another version that, oh, well, you're going to hell. We are not KJV only, okay? But in my opinion, the best, the closest that we're going to get to a literal uh, translation of the scriptures is going to be, uh, as far as in English, is going to be the King James Version of the Bible. Now, that being said, when we look at these words, we've got to understand that it was translated from Greek or from Hebrew or from Aramaic into English so we would understand. But we know English is a messed up language, right? Right? If you've ever taken English, you know. You know how do you spell cough? C-O-U-G-H. How do you spell bow? Like, like on a tree, like when, or, or bow, or, or bow, you know, like uh, when the bow breaks. B-O-U-G-H. It's not buff. It's bow. Well, what's T-H-R-O-U-G-H? It ain't throw, and it ain't thruff. It's through. English is messed up. That's just all that there is to it. You know, 
uh, uh, R-O-L-L. Now, most of us are probably thinking of bread, right? But you also R-O-L-L a ball. The two have nothing to do with each other, but they're spelled exactly the same. They're spoken exactly the same. We get confused. That's why I didn't do well in English for a while. So here's the thing. Uh, we've got to understand that the interpretation that is given, the translation that's given is the best that they were able to do at the time in their understanding. But this is where we have to dive deep into the word and not just listen to it and say, well, this is what I know this word to mean, so this is what this verse means. We've got to get into the word and we've got to study and see, well, what word is actually used? What, what is the context in which it's being used? The articles that are put in there to, to make that, that word and, and you know, what is, is really being said. When you take a look at, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him, that word believe, it doesn't just mean that I believe. It doesn't just mean that, yeah, I think it's real. There is a commitment. There is an understanding. There is a, a pledge that has to be given to that when you take a look at the actual meaning of that word. And so it goes beyond. So I'm, I'm saying all that to say this, and I, I don't mean to get off, off track. Let me try to reel it back in. There are so many that have been preaching doctrine and have been living doctrine that is not accurate because they have forgotten to study. Because what they'll do instead of study is they'll listen to vain babblings. I think it's interesting how so many people will post these internet preachers. And if they've got a huge church and they have great music and if everything's black except for the pretty lights behind him, and if the preacher is just, you know, he looks cool wearing skinny jeans and all that kind of stuff, and he's got a Starbucks cup in his hand, man, that's a good preacher. That's a great pastor. He's got a great church. Look how successful he is. And I do want to warn you, before I go any further, I do want to warn you not to judge a church by the number of people that are sitting in the pews or in the chairs, because you can fill a church very easily if you remove conviction, if you remove holiness, if you remove the, ne the need for salvation, if you remove anything that could possibly make them feel uh, uncomfortable, anything that could possibly make them feel like they aren't perfect just the way they are, you can fill up a church Sunday. If I were to announce it and say, we're not preaching about sin anymore, we're just going to preach about how much God loves you and we're going to sing a bunch of great songs. And, and I'll preach for five minutes. Well, if I say I'll preach for five minutes, everybody's going to come. But anyway, you could fill up the pews that way, but that doesn't mean that the Spirit is there. It doesn't mean that God is, is present in that place. So coming back to what I was saying, it, it, it cracks me up, but in a bad way, how I will see people that I know that are in the holiness church that will post some, some sort of heresy that some preacher who's a famous preacher said will get up there and will post it and say, Amen, brother, because they got a good reaction and because that guy's famous, so obviously he must know what he's talking about. And there have been so many times that I have wanted to get on their page and say, you do understand this is wrong, right? You do understand that this completely goes against this verse. Or you do understand this is a misinterpretation of this verse. There was one gentleman that I, he's, he's famous, if I were to mention his name, you'd know exactly who he was. There was one gentleman that I heard, and he was trying to say about how we are, uh, because of the fact that God has redeemed us, and we've been engrafted into the vine, if we're joined heirs with Christ, and Christ is God, that means that we are like God. Nope. No, we are not. No, sir. In fact, even when we have our resurrected bodies, when this life is over and we are in the presence of God and we have our resurrected bodies and we are 50,000 years into eternity, we are still not like God. God is still above us. But it's that whole humanity, uh, that pride of us trying to get ourselves up to that level. And he was trying to say how he's not afraid of the devil because, you know, the thing is he's like God. And if Jesus can just tell a spirit to go, then I can tell a spirit to go. Because I'm saying, and it's like, son, you need to put your pride in check because your ego, how does that phrase go in the movies? Your ego's writing checks that your body can't cash. Is that how it's said on Top Gun? 
Okay, nobody was seen Top Gun. Great. All right, so um, I forgot we're holiness. We don't watch movies. My bad. I apologize. Uh, and nobody has a TV in their house either. Okay, moving along from there. Uh, these fall under that whole line of the vain babblings, the, the profane and the vain babblings. But look at what the Bible says happens when we pay heed to those, when we don't shun those, when we don't turn away from those. Look at what the Bible says happens. It says they will increase unto more ungodliness. But then it says this, and their word will eat as doth a canker. Now, I know if you've been in church, you've probably heard canker or canker worm or that kind of thing. You've probably heard that before. You just know it's not a good thing. When you look up that word canker, the actual Greek for that, let me pull it up because I'm going to have to look at it so I can pronounce it properly. I'll still get it wrong. The actual Greek word for that is gangrena, where we get the word gangrene. Now, when you hear gangrene, you don't think of good things. When you hear gangrene, you're not thinking of something that is pleasant. You know, some of you, if you've ever been around somebody who had gangrene and you've ever smelled the odor that came from it, just by saying the word gangrene, maybe you're remembering that odor. Maybe you're remembering the look of it and all that. When you look up gangrene, because it's kind of one of these things where we know what it is, but we can't necessarily define it. So I looked up the definition of it, and I thought this was so interesting. It says, gangrene is a dangerous, excuse me, and potentially fatal condition that happens when the blood flow to a large area of tissue is cut off. Now let me tell you why that's important for us to remember spiritually. And there are no coincidences with God. I've said that before. There is no coincidence with God. The word that's here is here for a purpose. There's a reason why, there, why God had the, the, uh, the pens, the authors of the Bible, why I had them write these uh, particular words. Gangrene is when there is a large area of tissue cut off from the flow of blood and that tissue begins to die. In this situation, it's saying that if we listen to those vain babblings, those profane babblings, and we are not studying the words so we can rightly divide it, it causes more ungodliness and will eat as gangrene does. In the book of Leviticus, he's talking about how they're not supposed to eat blood, and it says because the life is in the blood. Life is in the blood. And I could get into this about how this applies to abortion and all that kind of thing. I'm not going to tonight. But here's what we need to look at. This is what Paul is saying as he's writing this to Timothy. He's saying when they listen to the vain babblings, they've been cut off from the blood. They've been cut off from the life. They've, been, they've cut themselves off from the very life of the Word. When they listen to these profane babblings, these things that just don't even make sense, these people that are just coming up with ideas and throwing them out there and saying, well, this is what I think, so this is my interpretation, and I believe that thus saith the Lord. Let me tell you, friend, the Lord didn't say anything about it if it goes against this word. If it goes against the rest of the word of God, that was not the Lord telling you what that verse meant. That was your own mind coming up with its own definition of it. We, we get in this place where we say, thus saith the Lord all the time, and, and, and the Lord said, and the Lord done did it. I was talking to a, 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 I'm trying to remember who it was I was talking to the other day. And we were talking about uh, churches. Oh, I, I remember who I was talking to. I was talking to a former pastor that we were talking about churches, and they were saying how there was a large church in this area where he was from that um, they were doing a pastoral search. And they had seven candidates for this church, because it was a good-sized church, had seven people that had said they were interested in coming in as pastor. Every one of those seven people said, the Lord told me I'm supposed to be the next pastor of this church. I want you to think about that for a second and see where the problem comes in. Seven different people, supposedly the Holy Spirit went to each one of them. You're going to be the next pastor of this church. Excuse me. You're going to be the next pastor of this church. You're going to be, all right, either God was playing a prank on them and saying, I'm just messing, it ain't none of y'all. Or these guys got it in their heads, I want to pastor that church because I'm probably going to make more money or it's a bigger church, I'll be elected to the 
council, blah, 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 the politics of it or whatever. And so because they wanted it, they said, oh, well, you know what? I keep thinking about, well, thus saith the Lord. I need to let these people know. And that way, if they don't vote me in as pastor, well, they're going against the word of God. Well, they went against the word of God six out of seven times, apparently, because every single one of them said that God had said that they were supposed to be pastor. My very first youth pastor position, uh, I was, Lord, I was ignorant of church politics. I was ignorant of the way things were supposed to go. This is how, how smart I was. To go and be a youth pastor, I put on my resume under work experience how I was a car hop at Sonic. Let me tell you, not a whole lot of pastors looking for somebody who knows how to make change and knows how to bring out a foot-long cheese coney and knows how to put down a foot-long cheese coney. But anyway, that's how stupid I was. But he was telling me about the guy that came in to interview before me. And he was somebody who was related to somebody big in the church of God and all that kind of thing or whatever. And so he, you know, he was like, well, I mean, if I can use him, I'll use him. And, and this guy sat in front of the pastor of the church. And as a pastor was talking to him one-on-one -on -one and was just asking him about his vision and stuff, he said, well, I can tell you all that, but really none of it matters because the thing is, is that I'm going to be the next youth pastor at this church. Let me give you a hint if you ever want to try to uh, get on as a staff member at a church. Don't tell the pastor I'm going to be because you won't. Because uh, pastors are like, oh, really? I was going to hire you, but never mind. Forget you. Get out of my face. Uh, that's just the way it goes. Uh, just like when I came here, I didn't tell the board, oh, I'm going to be your next pastor. Because they would have been like, thank you for applying. And next, and then they would have gotten somebody else. But this guy sat in front of the pastor and said, I'm going to be the next youth pastor of this church. And he goes, oh, you think so? He said, oh, I know so. Because when I was praying about it, the Lord told me I was. And the pastor said, he told him straight to his face, said, that wasn't the Lord. And said, thank you, and let him leave the office. And that was it. And he sent him home. The whole point of me saying that is this. We get in this place where we, we try to let our own thoughts, we, we just brand, thus saith the Lord on it, and then we try to run with that. But the problem is, if we're not studying the word to make sure that what we're thinking and what we're going through is accurate, then these are vain babblings. We're cutting ourselves off from the life of the word. We're caught, cutting ourselves off from the blood flow. When you get pastors that will preach that there is no hell, that, that God loves us too much to where there won't be a hell if you either are going to heaven or you're just going to cease to exist, or even, even worse, that everybody gets to go to heaven, that because Jesus died on the cross, he died for sin past, present, and future, and so you can't sin because Jesus has already forgiven you, and we're all going to heaven. Everybody that's ever lived since the crucifixion and the resurrection is going to heaven. And they're preaching that. They have no scripture to back it up, but they're preaching it, and people are shouting amen and saying, that's right, pastor, and thanks so much for preaching that because that's the way I want to live. And then they go and they live their lives, and it says that it leads to more ungodliness, and it says that it eats away as a canker. What's happening is that we've got people in the churches that and I'm not talking about these churches that are like wackadoodle. I'm talking about PH churches, Church of God, Assemblies of God, Baptists. We've got people that are, that are sitting in the pews week after week after week after week thinking I'm going to be with Jesus someday. And the problem is they've never given their heart or life to Christ. They've never asked forgiveness of their sin. They don't live a life that's conducive to the, the ways of Christ. And all they think is because I'm in church, it's good enough. And it's eating away at them, and they're dying, and they don't even realize it. And the only way to get rid of that, I actually looked this up. Two best ways to get rid of gangrene so you can survive gangrene. Number one is one most of us already know about, amputate. Cut it. Cut it away. Cut it off. Get rid of it. If you have, which you don't, but if you have a pastor that is teaching you uh, things that are not true with the Word of God, you cut away if you're looking at some guy online, some woman online, and they're preaching more about how much money you can get in your pocket if you give to them than they are about how you can get yourself into heaven, you need to cut that out of your life. The only way that you're going to be able to get away from that, that you're going to be able to um, not be affected by those vain babblings is to cut it away. But this part I thought was interesting. I'm going to try to wrap it up with this. How many of you have ever heard of hyperbaric treatment, hyperbaric oxygen treatment? All right, several of you. Okay. More of you than knew the verse earlier. Um, <laughs> I'm just playing with you. 
For those of you who don't know, hyperbaric oxygen treatment is when they, it doesn't sound good. They put a plastic hood over your head. All right, that part doesn't sound good. But apparently, when they put this hood over your head, they are pump, pumping a very concentrated oxygen into that hood so that what you're breathing is not just oxygen, but it's, it's a, a very high concentration of oxygen that you're breathing. So it's pure. And what happens is as the oxygen goes into the body, it begins to reach to places that have been cut off from oxygen, such as places that are gangrenous. It, it will reach those places and begin to help them to heal. It will begin to help the, the cells to heal from the, the infection, from the gangrene. I thought it was so interesting that it was oxygen, that it was air, that it was wind, because I began to think about the Holy Spirit. And I began to think about how one of the symbols of the Holy Spirit, one of the things that represent the Holy Spirit, is the wind. We got in Acts uh, chapter 2, and suddenly there was a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the room where they were in. And we, we talk about how you know, the breath of God is the inspiration. Once again, the wind, you know, the air. And we talk about how uh, you know, the Holy Spirit, how uh, you know, the, just a breeze that was blowing, and, and the, the Holy Spirit being you know, that breeze. And, and I think it's just incredible when we look at the way that there are things in the spiritual that are so mimicked in the physical, that are so represented in the physical. And one of the only ways to get rid of this deadly infection either is either to cut it off completely or is to treat it with pure air, with pure oxygen. That's not been diluted. That's not been uh, polluted in any way with somebody's ideas, with somebody else's interpretation. But it's you getting with the Holy Spirit and saying, God, I believe that maybe I have, you've shown me that I have been listening to some things that maybe I don't need to be listening to. I've been saying some things that I don't need to be saying. I've been giving you credit for things that actually are completely against your word. I've been doing all this stuff, and, and God, I realize now that I've, I've been wrong. Lord, I need you to show me. I need you to breathe in me, to give me your inspiration. And then you go and you begin to study the word. And if you're... If you read the Bible without praying first and asking the Holy Spirit to reveal things to you, you're doing it all wrong. You're reading a book. You're not studying the Word. And I, I'm not trying to be harsh. I'm just being honest with you. If you go into your Bible reading and you say, okay, well, I'm going to read three chapters today, and then by the end of the year, I'll read the whole Bible in a year. That's great. I have no problem with people that want to read the Bible through in a year. God bless you. I would prefer, though, that you take a whole month studying one chapter of one book, but you know that thing inside and out. And God has revealed things to you through the power of the Holy Spirit. If you sit down and you say, all right, I'm just going to read, and you got the TV on, or you got music going, or whatever it is, and you're just reading, and you're like, oh, oh, I'm already done with the chapter. Okay, well, good. Well, there you go, Jesus. I did my part. I read the Word. That's not what He's asking you to do. He's saying to study. How are you to hide the Word in your heart that you might not sin against God if you don't even know what the Word says? How do we know what the Word says? We study. We get into it. We don't worry about the vain babblings. We don't worry about what these other people are saying. We, we see what happened with uh, Hymenaeus and Philetus. It says uh, in verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. That's the last thing I, I want to talk about, and then, then I'm going to close. The, and overthrow the faith of some. Listen, we all have to make our own decision, okay? You know, where the Bible says, work out your own salvation. I can't blame Brandy for leading me astray and, you know, and stand before God and say, well, Brandy said this, though, God, and God's going to look at her and go, well, shame on you. It's all your fault that he's going to hell. I can't do that. I have to take my own, uh, uh, my own eternity into my hands. I'm accountable for that myself, okay? But at the same time, if I'm getting up saying I'm a preacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ or I'm a teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that I'm going to expound on the word of God, I better bring something that's truthful. Because somebody who is, who is new in the word, somebody who is freshly saved, somebody who is, is just getting into the Bible, you should have been here. No, anyway. Uh, but one of the other things that Brother Steve and I were, were talking about is the amount of blood that's going to be on the hands of some of these that have been preaching false gospel. But they think 
they're doing the right thing. Because they haven't studied. They found a scripture and they twisted it so it would fit their agenda. Like, for example, if you're a, an abusive husband, if you just want to keep your wife under submission and under control, wives, submit yourselves under your husbands. And then you stop. So that means, woman, go make me a sandwich. Or that means if I want to go golfing, I'm going to go golfing. I don't care if you want me to go see your mama, I'm going golfing. And that means that if we got to go to Georgia for our niece's graduation and I don't want to go, then I get to stay home. And I'm not going to go to the graduation and you can go by yourself. I'm not, I'm not missing the graduation. I prayed for rain and it didn't work. So... Um, <laughs> So I'll be out there at 8.30 on, on a Saturday morning, which is something that's lovely to me. You'll see my, my niece walk from here to here. But anyway, moving along from there. Uh, no, it means a lot and all that kind of thing. I'm being silly. But the, the thing is, is that when we, when we take the word and we try to find verses that meet what we want to say, that meet our agenda, that's misusing the word of God. Instead, what it should be is that as we read the word, the word changes us. We're not using the word to validate our, our uh, opinions or our doctrines, but instead we're using the word to show us what our doctrines are supposed to be and what our beliefs are supposed to be. But it all comes down to study. So what I want to say, because like I said, I, I really wanted to try to, to end this at a decent time and all that kind of thing. But what I really want to challenge you about it and what I want to ask you about is this how, how many of you and don't raise your hands uh, not that you usually do but how many of you still try to memorize scripture you still try to find scripture that you can and, and you read it over and over and over until you know it by heart we do as children you know we, we raise our kids to know scripture not as much as we used to we should do more of that but we raise our, our kids to know Scripture so that they can hide the Word in their hearts so they won't sin against God. But how many of us as adults are still trying to memorize Scripture? How many of us that are, are maybe some mean people would consider you elderly are still trying to learn Scripture that you don't already know? Still trying to memorize it. And I understand. I'm with you. I get it. The older I get, the less I remember. And it's mostly whatever Crystal tells me. I don't know how that works out, but... And I, I still think she fools me sometimes and says, yes, I already told you, and she didn't. And I just, I'm like, I assume she did. And she's like, Phew. anyway, but how many of us are really making an effort to learn the word, not just read the word, not even just study the word, but to learn the word, to memorize it, to make it to where it's a part of us, to where if somebody says, well, what does such and such say? Oh, I know that verse. That verse says da 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 And then you're able to say the whole thing. How many of us still do that at this age? Or are we just saying, well, Lord, just take me when you're ready? If there's breath in your body, you should still be trying to grow closer to Christ. If you have any mental uh, capabilities whatsoever to be able to memorize, to be able to learn, this is what we need to be learning. We don't need to be learning about the 20 greatest Karens that got thrown out of Walmart. We don't need to be worried. Uh, we don't need to be learning about stuff that isn't going to affect our eternity. Uh, in fact, I would think the older we get, the more we'd want to learn the Word because the closer we're getting to be into that eternity. Just saying. All right. But we know that the, the reason why we've got to make sure we're dividing the Word, first of all, not to make God ashamed, or that we're rightly dividing the Word, rather, excuse me, first of all, not to make God ashamed, but also because of the fact that if we're saying it in error, if it becomes vain, if it becomes profane, it's leading to more ungodliness. My friends, the last thing we need in the world today is more ungodliness. The last thing we need in the church today is more ungodliness. And we need people in the church to understand and to get to that place. And I, I was saying about how I know that I preach hard, and I, I know there are probably some people that don't like to hear me preach because they want me to preach more positive thinking type things and I'm okay, you're okay type of things. But I'm telling you right now, I, I'm, I'm okay with God, but I'm still not where I need to be with God. And I would assume that's the same with you. You may be satisfied with where you are with God. That doesn't mean you're okay with God. 
We need to be pushing forward. We need to be studying the word. We need to know what we're talking about. And please be careful when you're listening to people online because you don't have to know what you're talking about to get online in case anybody's not noticed that. You don't even have to have half a brain in your head to be able to say something online and post it online. Some of these people that post stuff, they drive me insane. And I'm like, you, you, why are you allowed to be out in public? I don't understand that. Anybody can say anything they want to. Don't just listen to it and say, well, I heard the preacher say, get into the Word, see what God said. See what the Word has to say about it. Our studying is so important. All right. Um, I, I go on, but I'm going to stop, I promise. Okay. Let me just ask real quickly before I dismiss. Are there any questions or comments? Because I've not been doing that lately. I need to give you that opportunity. Anybody with a question or a comment that you would like to make? Yes, ma'am. No, no, no. Whatever you do, that's an excellent question. She's asking, to get study of the Word, do we just start at the beginning and move through? No, don't do that. Because once you hit Leviticus, you're going you're gonna to look for a white flag to wave and be like, you know, I got the first two down. I'm good enough. You know, it's good. No, what I recommend, the, the two books that I recommend you start, and, and this is for everybody because you might say, well, I've, I've been in church my whole life. I know how to study the Word of God. Really, do you? But do you? You might think you do, but do you really know how to study the Word? My recommendation for new Christians, start in the book of Romans. The reason why, Romans is basically our user manual. Now, the whole Bible, obviously, is the Word of God, okay? And there's, there's so many, but I mean, you're talking about an infinite God and a finite mind trying to understand it. There are so many different facets and, and, and perspectives and all that that come through the whole word, but if you're just trying to get your basics down, start in Romans. Um, Romans chapter 8 is considered to be probably the most instructive and most powerful chapter of the Bible if you're going to have to select one just because of Paul going through and talking about mortifying the deeds of the body and, and the flesh and how the flesh is evil and the spirit is good and how we have to be more like Christ. We, we need to understand how we're going to uh, be successful in our relationship with God and, and that's in Romans 8, but the whole, the whole chapter is just, or the whole book rather, is wonderful. But then also the book of John. Uh, John is because it's a, it's a different version from the other Gospels. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke are called synoptic Gospels. Uh, for those of you who don't know, the word synoptic means seen with one eye. In other words, they're all come from the same perspective. Start with the birth of Jesus, move through his life, go to his death and resurrection, that sort of thing. Whereas John kind of is... He's kind of almost jumping in midstream, sort of. And he, he takes it from some different perspectives, but it, it, it gives you a very complete picture of Christ, okay? Whereas the others are more historical, I guess, uh, is the best way for me to put it, where they're more historical, and I'm not saying anything bad about them, okay? <laughs> not saying anything bad about one word in the Word of God. But John is going to be more of um, a character sketch of who Christ is. Those are the first two that I would recommend. Once you get to the place where you are pretty solid in your relationship with God, you're pretty solid in your Bible study techniques, then maybe we can go to, well, how did we all begin? And start in Genesis and you know, begin to move through that. But, um, but yeah, I, I mean, I, I love all the Word, but let me tell you, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, heavenly day. I'm just saying. Well, that's the thing, even in Genesis, and Adam begat so, uh, you know, Seth, and, and Seth begat so-and-so, and then this one begat so-and-so, this one begat so-and-so. I mean, I was seven years old and knew what the word begat meant. You know, and you go ask a seventh grader now and say, well, what does begat mean? They'd be like, what? The gap. But anyway, um, but, you know, even, but it all has a purpose, and that's the thing, is that every single word that's in there has a purpose. How many of you remember the prayer of Jabez when that came out? That that little book came out back in the 90s, I guess it was. Uh, the prayer of Jabez. I mean, it was a movement, man. People were buying this little tiny book and all this kind of thing, and everybody was praying the prayer of Jabez. Because in the middle of all this numbering of people, 
All of a sudden, it talks about Jabez. I think it's two verses. It talks about this man, Jabez, and he prays that God would enlarge uh, his tent strings. And, and that God, in other words, he, it's a prayer of him where he's asking God to increase what he has, but not just his, his uh, property, but like his responsibility and, and his, his relationship and all that. Lord have mercy. People were going nuts about that. And it's like two verses right in the middle of, and in, in Judah, they had 500,312, you know, this and that. And, and all of them had goats and pigs and, or not pigs, but anyway, you know, and it's just kind of going through there. And all of a sudden, here's this little nugget right in the middle of it. It all has a purpose. It helps us when we get into apologetics. It helps us trace in the genealogy of Christ. You know, we can take a look and we can see how there, you may not realize this, but there are actually studies now that are beginning to admit that all humankind came from two people. Now, they don't want to say it was Adam and Eve. They want to say it was like the two people that evolved from fish nuggets or something and, and came out of the water and suddenly they had babies and made everybody else. You know? But there, there are actually studies that are starting to show and starting to admit, but they keep them kind of hush-hush because they don't want people to say, well, the Bible's been saying that for thousands of years. You know? uh, but they will actually say that science is now catching up with the Word of God and is now saying that they can trace all DNA back to, to, to one couple, one strand. And all it is is science catching up with the Word. Well, when you are, are studying something like that, like apologetics of that nature, that's where the lineages all come in. And that's where it really gets important as far as uh, that kind of thing. But uh, the whole Word is good. The whole Word is good, obviously. Start at Romans and, and John, and that'll, that'll get you on the, right, on the right track. Anybody else, you have a comment or a question you want to make real quick? Mm-hmm. Right. And I started in the Old Testament. And it was hard for me. You started where? In the Old Testament. Oh, and yeah. It was hard for me. So I, on my own, I went to the New Testament. And I read it. And it made, then I, it kind of, I, it made it some help to me. Well, and you know, Genesis is full of all the, all the different, I don't want to say stories, accounts. Things that are exciting to read about, like Noah and the Ark, you know, Adam and Eve in the garden, you know, Cain killing Abel. You got Joseph in his coat of many colors. You know, you've got Jacob wrestling with the angel. You got uh, Abraham uh, going and uh, you know putting Isaac on the the altar and God stopping him. You know, you've got all these great Sunday school stories that you hear about in the book of Genesis, or and they're all in the book of Genesis. And then Exodus goes into Moses and and him. Uh, you know, killing the Egyptian and having to run away, or you know, or, and they found Moses and the bulrushes, you know, in the basket, and how God preserved him and stuff, and all this kind of stuff, and and then they cross the Red Sea, and all these things happen, and then when it gets into the law, if you aren't just really just strong in your relationship with God and in your Bible study already, you you're going to drift off just because you're still so young in it, you're still so new in it. Um, once again, it's all good, but if you really want to know what's the best way for me to be a Christian, go straight to Romans. Go straight to Romans. Not a lot of Christian talk in, in the Old Testament either because Christ didn't come yet. All right, so uh, anyway, yes, ma'am. Oh, okay, I thought something had happened. I, I was just kind of pull that out of me. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. we had gone and, and uh, seen Sister Loris, uh, or I had gone and seen Sister Loris on Saturday, and uh, yeah, she's doing much, much, I mean, obviously, she's 95 plus, and, uh, and she um, has been through a lot. Uh, she still has the tube because of the liver and, uh, infection. They said that's probably going to be permanent, but she's actually doing very well. She was her sassy old self on Saturday. I, she had me cracking up. So uh, anyway, she... She was talking about something, rolled her eyes at one point, and I thought, woman. <laughs> anyway, but yeah, let's continue to remember her in our prayers. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes. Um, I, I'm not sure if everybody saw on Facebook or not, um, Kay's father-in-law passed away. Uh, Wade passed away yesterday evening just before 10. Um, my understanding, my understanding, 
is that uh, they're actually going to be having a memorial. He's going to be cremated. They're going to have a memorial service for him uh, in June. Uh, there's a reason for that. But uh, that's my understanding. Uh, that may change, so we don't know. But um, the great thing about it is that Wade, his entire life, had not lived for God. He didn't go to church. He, he wasn't saved. He was doing his own thing. Um, and I guess in the last week or so, his wife actually heard him trying to pray. and He had never prayed before. And so he was saying things like, I'm not even sure what I'm supposed to say. And I mean, I know I, I got to talk to you, but I'm not sure how I'm supposed to do it and all this kind of thing. Well, when he was told on Saturday, uh, he was at uh, Trident, Maine. And when he was told on Saturday that he could stop the dialysis because there was no hope that he was going to die, he turned to Kay, who had been witnessing to him. And he said, call your preacher. Tell him I need him to come pray with me. I need to meet Jesus. And Kay called me. I was in Lake City at a business session, and I hightailed it out of there, dropped off the pastor I had brought to the business session, and then went to Trident, Maine. And I got there, and um, I won't go into details, but let me just tell you, it was sincere. You could see it on his face. And after we prayed, you could see the peace that came over him. And um, I have no question it was, it was sincere. And so we can rejoice that uh, in the 11th hour. Now listen, don't wait till the 11th hour. All right, I mean, I'm sure now he wishes he would have gone, if he could go back, he would have lived his whole life for Christ and worked for the kingdom of God. Don't wait for the 11th hour because not everybody gets warning, first of all. And second of all, if you already know better, just live for him now. Just, huh, anyway. Uh, but, uh, but we do rejoice in the fact that um, there, there's a song that's out that says that hell lost another one. And, uh, and that's what happened, so... But please keep Ron and the family in your prayers. Obviously, his wife of many, many, many years is devastated. But uh, please keep the family in your prayers. And we'll just keep you up to date with what's going on you know, as we find out. Okay? All right. Let's pray, and then we'll be dismissed tonight. Father, thank you so much, Lord, for your word. I thank you, God, that you give us the opportunity to study. Lord, I thank you that you have, have put it in us, God, to try to draw closer to you through your word. And I pray that we will not be led astray by this person's opinion or that person's opinion, but Lord, that we'll do the study ourselves, and the Holy Spirit will reveal to us what your word is saying. And we know that when the Holy Spirit does, there will be other scripture to back it up. Father, I pray for the needs that were mentioned. I pray that you'll minister to each one. And we give you glory and praise and just help us to get back to our home safely tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 God bless you. You still got a little.